So the first part of the Parsha takes us through the days of creation. So the whole concept of God revealing to us how he created the world raises a question. And the question is, what are we supposed to do with this information? If the answer to anything in Torah is when you say, what do I do with this information? No, 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 it's good, useful information. That's no good. What does it tell you that God created the world and how? What does that tell you? So, and therefore? And therefore, we are accountable for our actions. Oh, good. And therefore, we fit into a pattern. So what you see in the days of creation is that one thing gives birth, so to speak, to another, beginning with light and energy, ending up with humans. We have a pyramid. And everything fits in. Everything has a purpose. Nothing is random. So there are two main ideas here. One is the idea of being a, create, a creation in a created world, which means that you aren't, the, hold on, you aren't the center of the world. The world existed with the plan that pre-existed you. The souls of the Jewish people pre-existed creation. Everything was formed in order to allow us to find our place. After we finish the days of creation, which is going to be our focus tomorrow, what you find is, uh, is humans have a unique place. So unlike everything else, other than time, the purpose is described. So there's no purpose described for grass, for animals, but for time and for humans, purpose is discussed. What do you think the purpose of time is? Give me a reasonable definition of time first. Physical. It is physical, like matter. It's limited like matter, but what is it? It's not matter. We measure it, but what is it? What is it that we measure? Progression. Progression, OK. So what time is, this is like a physicist's definition of time, would be the process of measurable change. So it's very, very much connected with matter. We measure time through rotations and revolution and revolutions. Oops, OK. But um, what it is, in essence, is the progression of change. So it says in the Torah why we have to see change. God could have created a world that's static. So if you were a fish in the sea but had a human mind, you wouldn't know about time. Do you realize this? There's no day there. There's no night there. There's nothing to measure. So the reason why we have to be able to measure time, it says in the text, is as signs and occasions of meeting. Signs of what? The fact that you got up today and that you see the sun, and you see it's light, and at night it was dark. What does that tell you? It's a sign of what? So I want to make my, my question clearer. Suppose you couldn't read Arabic. Do any of you read Arabic? No. OK. So you, it's not suppose. You really can't read Arabic. And you're in, um, you're in the old city. You're in the shuk. And you see a sign over an open business. OK? But you don't know what it says, right? How would you find out what it is? We could ask someone. You would say, Maze, and they would say, in Andebralia, Ibria, and that, and that wouldn't help you a whole lot. He would go in and look and see what it is. So when you look at a day, what it tells you is that there's a new beginning. So it's a sign. It's saying, here is a new beginning. So that means that you're meant to have a relationship to the progression of time, as seeing renewal and difference. OK, so that's the idea of it being a sign. It's a sign of renewal and possibility. It's a place, it also creates the possibility of times of meeting. We just finished the high holidays, which we could only determine through the movements of the earth and the, um, and the sun and moon, right? So the idea is that God invested specific spiritual capaci uh, capacities within time that we could measure and relate to. So that's the purpose of time. Are any of you into physics? No, OK. So I'm not going to recommend a book on the very same topic by a non-Jewish physicist who doesn't believe in God. OK, whatever. OK, repress it. <laughs> OK, what's human purpose? And the reason why it's a valid question, other than the Torah tells us what it is, is that the vast majority of the world is mineral. Is that true or not? <coughs> yep, earth, sea, it's mineral. OK, so if you were like, let's say, a seashell, how would you spend your day? Like, what do you, what's your purpose? If you were a rock, what's your purpose? I feel like animals know their purpose more than humans do. 
Okay, so let's, before we even get to animals, what would be the purpose of being a stone? For humans. Hmm? It takes all the way up to people, but before that it would support vegetation, right? Yeah. So even though vegetation is less than minerals, minerals support vegetation. So now, the, but vegetation does more. Okay, so if you were a daisy, you're much more active than a stone. What are some things a daisy does that a stone doesn't do? It grows. It grows, dies, changes, reproduces, <coughs> absorbs, um, absorbs chlorophyll, okay, clear? So whatever your animal is, it does more than a daisy. It sees, it hears, it could direct its own locomotion. That's a fancy way of saying it moves. Okay, um, it, it has primitive emotion, right? Okay, so it does more, but there's far less animal life than there is vegetation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now humans. Remember you still have your favorite animal in your mind? Mm -hmm. Tell me five things that you could do that your favorite animal can't do. Okay, no, the lion can kill you. <laughs> okay, yeah. What are some other things that uh, you could do that, let's say, a lion, a cat? Okay, you could speak intelligibly and abstractly and express emotion through your speech, which animals don't do. Tell me more. You could laugh and smile, which animals don't do. Okay, you could live in the future. You could live in the past. Okay, you could relate emotionally in a much more sophisticated way. You're creative, animals don't make computer programs. Okay, you're aesthetically conscious, you don't have to buy matching drapes to the wall color if you're um, a giraffe, okay, clear? Okay, so humans have far more potential, but they're far less numerous. But what you see is everything supports the level above it, so vegetation, supports animal life. Mineral life supports vegetation. Animal life, vegetation, mineral life all support humans. What do humans support? If you were to take every single person off the planet and move us all to Mars, mm -hmm. okay, what would happen to the rest of the planet? Exist. You really think so? What do you think would happen? Think of places in the world where there are few people or no people. Oh. Just go out of control. It'll do just Fine. Okay, clear. Greener, nicer, more. It'll flourish. Okay, so that leaves us with the pro with the question: of, So, what are humans here for? Okay, so the Torah tells us this. So we're going to get a few pieces of information. The first piece of information is that we're meant to dominate everything. Do you see where humans use everything and dominate it? Next piece of information, we're in God's image, so our, do our dominion over the world is meant to be an expression of this, that we're in God's image. We're supposed to use the world in a way that's noble. Okay, next thing, we're supposed to work and we're supposed to preserve. So working in this sense doesn't mean making the world operative, because the world is operative without us. Working means giving everything purpose. Preserving it means preserving it from who? <laughs> Us. Okay, clear? So that's basic human purpose. We're meant to use the divine image within us to give purpose to the physical world. Okay, this makes sense to you? Okay. So now that we know what we're here for, okay, God threw another piece of... Um, if I would say puzzling information into this picture. One is by dividing the first human being into two segments, male and female, which did not happen in everything else. Everything else was created with both male and female segments in existence. You don't have the female giraffe being divided and taken away from the male giraffe, okay? So you have the story of the creation of the first woman coming from the first man, okay? Which is very unique. And then you have God presenting the first humans with the challenge, don't eat of the forbidden fruit, which is very puzzling. What, what are the puzzles involved in these things? Flesh it out. Since you first said you can have every fruit, you can have every tree. You could have every, everything except this one. Yeah. Okay, so pretend it was um, holiday eve, you take 
your four-year-old nephew to, the, to uh, the toy store, and you say you could have any toy you want except this one. What's going to happen next? He's going to want that toy. Only. Only. So, could you see where that's true? Mm -hmm. Okay, now move it up from a four-year-old to a 25-year-old, like close to your ages. Okay, and you're told you could have anything, you, you could have any career you want except this one. What will you find yourself wanting? Not At least to explore that one. Okay, so the more sophisticated you are, the more insulting the restriction is. Could you see where this is so? So what's that all about? What's restriction about? That's a big question. Another question going back to the separation of the first human into two segments, male and female, would be, of course, why? And if they're the same, why not just create a lot of them all at once? So today we're going to go into this very superficially. This will be the main course of our topic tomorrow. So here are the assumptions. The assumptions here, as we, as we said already, humans are different than other cre creations. We're in God's image. What's that supposed to mean, since God has no physical image? What's that? I was surprised, by the way, that you let that one go. Is that more in God's image? Okay, girl, okay, okay. <laughs> what do you think that means? It's got to mean something. What does it mean to be in God's image, since God has no physical image? It's just terms that we can understand. Okay, so first it's using human terminology, because that's the only language we speak. But what does it mean? Okay, good. So remember we spoke about some differences between us and your favorite animal? Those are all reflective of our having something within us that they don't have. So I want to reflect this. One is speech. The purpose of speech is to have your will and thoughts known to someone else in a way that's deep and connective. Okay, we're aesthetic, which means that we see balance and harmony, which animals don't necessarily see, which is also an aspect of the divine self. On the deepest level, this is why we love truth. Truth has to do with our love of harmony and balance, meaning what a person is saying, what they're doing, what they're thinking, are all on the same page. Okay, um, we're creative. We're, we could make profound connections. All of this reflects the divine image. But more than anything else, and I want you to hear this carefully, the, what reflects the divine image is that we could make choices. Everything else in nature does what it's programmed to do. So this is why instinctively, we all know that there's no such thing as an evil tiger. Even if a tiger was to kill a human being, it may be necessary to kill the tiger to protect humans, but not because it's an evil tiger. Okay, is that so? So humans aren't programmed, so we're free. And the only other reality that's genuinely free is God himself. So a reflection of this is if a baby is born today, you have no idea of who this baby will be in 50 years. Is that true or not? Yeah. Okay, that's not true of an elephant or a giraffe or a dog or, you know, you know exactly who they'll be. You know? Okay, so we have freedom. This kind of freedom is meant to be our most significant challenge. So the core of our spiritual traits is as follows. Bear with me because this is a big idea. The spiritual side of who we are, the godlike side, always says give, be creative, be connective, give. The physical side of us, because we also have bodies and our bodies are very much like animal bodies. What's the basic message of the body? Take. take. So there's a time to take and a time to give, and this requires great choice making and the use of enormous amount of intellectual and emotional power. Now, there are only two ways of giving to another human being, which is certainly the most noble way of giving. Real giving and illusory giving. So here's how illusory giving goes. Okay, you're a Jewish mother. Okay, you're in your 40s. You have children who are now reaching adulthood. You always wanted your <coughs> oldest child to be a doctor. Could this happen? So you've told, shall we make it a boy or a girl? What do you want your oldest child to be? Boy, girl? 
So she, she says, boy, it'll be boy. He always wanted him to be a doctor. So when he was around five, he bought him a little doctor kit with a st its plastic stethoscope. And the, you know, did any of you have the golden book? Um, something Dan the Band-Aid Man. Dr. Dan the Band-Aid Man. Did you have that one? So it's about Dan and how it, like he puts Band-Aids on his teddy bears and he, he, you know, he makes them feel good. And eventually he grows up to become a... I knew you'd figure this out, okay? And in high school, it was very important that he do well in what? Biology. Science, biology, chemistry. And um, you got that across. Like, you know, you really want to succeed. Okay. And uh, is it conceivable that he doesn't want to be a doctor? Have things like this happened? even to Jews. What's the a career that's a respectable career but antithetical to medicine? Something the exact opposite. Art. Art. He wants to be an artist. <laughs> okay. So when he was little and, and you gave him the stethoscope, he would take his crayons and put the stethoscope on a paper, make circles. Around, okay, got this? And then make like an eyes, nose, and mouth in the circle. Okay, clear? When you got him Dr. Dan, the Band-Aid Man, he would say, and now the teddy bear looks better. <laughs> OK, clear? What subject interested him in, in high school? Let's say you put him in an academic high school where they don't teach art. What subject um, would interest him? English literature, because he'd be, okay, he, he would like poetry. How do you think he would do in chemistry, which is high school chemistry, in my opinion. Like, University chemistry is interesting, but high school chemistry is beyond boring. Did any of you like high school chemistry? You liked it? Not uh, in college. In college, at least you know what the different compounds do, but when you just have to, mem like memorizing the tables, I found extremely boring. Okay, but in any case, he not only is bored by it, he can't do it. Okay, clear, he just can't do it. Okay, could you picture a lot of tension? Okay, so here it is. He um, refuses to go on to university. He's either going to go to art school or he's going to get a job, okay? Could you picture the, the fighting in the house? Oh, yes. Does the mother see herself as a giver or a taker? A giver, but she's She thinks she's a giver. Is she a giver or a taker? taker. She's a taker, okay, clear? Okay, so the reason I'm telling you this is that being a real giver means that you're attuned to the needs of the other, not to your own need to give. So that requires, if you're giving, be honest, that you have something that the other person needs. So if you have two people, and they both have all the money in the world, but nothing else, neither of them could give honestly to the other one. OK, clear? So the creation of two genders, which again, save your questions about that, about anything else about this for tomorrow. The creation of two genders is so that each could give what the other one doesn't have honestly. So that means from a Judaic perspective, the worst response to the fact that there are two genders is acting like there aren't two genders. <coughs> because that's the statement of saying there's only one gender, and that's called human, Okay, which people, okay, is saying, I have nothing that you, that I have nothing to give you. So I could live for who? For myself. For myself. Okay, you have nothing that you need to receive from me. That's the worst of all possible responses to there being two genders. So what the differences are between the two genders are real, purposeful, God-given, and meant to be treasured as opposed to be seen as a challenge to be overcome. Okay, clear? Mm -hmm. Do people today see the gender differences as a challenge to be overcome? In today's world, gender equality, and I'm, again, we'll talk more about this next time because I want to go back to free choice, is illusory because the movement towards gen gender equality has to do with women becoming more like men as opposed to men simultaneously becoming more like women. Could you see where this is so? Mm -hmm. So that's, this is, that means that for all sorts of reasons that we'll discuss in greater depth tomorrow, women don't really believe they have something to give, nor do men necessarily want to receive what women can give. This is a big problem from a Judaic perspective. Okay, clear? Let's go back to free choice. 
So what free choice means is that you're not wired to make choices. However, you are wired to some degree. We're not God. So what are some of the things that limit your ability to make choices that affect your life? Okay, so we're all born to specific environments, and anybody who says that the environment doesn't affect you at all isn't being so honest. Is that true? Okay, we also live in specific bodies. So if I were to say, you know what, I've had enough of teaching in the VA. I want to be a ballerina. Is this going to work? <laughs> this is not going to work. This is like not, in fact, even when I was young, that wouldn't have worked. When I was, I remember this still, my aunt who lived in Baltimore, I lived in New York, which to me Baltimore could have been like a whole other planet. She would come in for holidays sometimes, and she once gave me a black, an ebony black jewelry box, which as a child of five or six I needed desperately, you understand, for all my fine jewelry. And it had um, a pop-up ballerina that went around to a stranger in paradise. So I decided I want to be a ballerina. Now, you know sometimes you see older people say, oh, well, you see me now, but when I was young, it was so different. No, I was always basically like, I was never graceful, I was never slender. I was like, I was always more, just, like, just like I am now, but younger, you know what I mean? So I told my mom, I want to be a ballerina. I still remember this, like, fakey smile. <laughs> a ballerina? How about, you know, like, a doctor? <laughs> You know, so uh, you know, so your body makes a lot of choices for you. Okay, clear. So uh, I remember when I got a little bit bigger, I went to the library. I got these ballerina books. Did any of you ever go through a ballerina stage? So, uh, so they have the steps in the book. So I made these like paper, you know, construction paper outlines of my feet and put the the steps patterns on the floor. So I'm. It was like very elephantine ballet, and even, even I realized it wasn't graceful, you know, like, that ended it. But um, in any case, so this is, you're a prisoner of your environment, of your body. What are some other things that limit you? That's not, there's more. Ah, you're stuck in the present. That's a huge, that's a very great limitation. We're stuck in the present. We don't know anything about the distant past. We certainly don't know the future. Here's another one, we're mortal. So that's a limitation. Okay, so we're not God, but we have within this frame some ca capacity for choices in one area. The one area where we could make choices is morality. So when people say you could be whatever you want to be, that's not true on a physical level. Everybody has limitations. But spiritually, you could be whoever you want to be. Okay, that makes sense to you? Someone should argue with that point. What do you mean you could spiritually you Okay, so if I'm going to, yeah. You grow up in like a oh, oh, say it, yeah. You're <laughs> saying the right words, New, no, Say it. I feel like if you grow up in a, I don't know if I'm saying the right words, but if you grow up in a, an environment that is pro, like, negativity, and, like, I guess your freedom of choice is to choose positivity, but, like, at the end of the day, like, you're not going to be decided. So oh. it's like, how do you choose? Like, you have limited choices. Oh, so what she's saying is you have limited choices. So I want to give you an extreme example. Yeah, I'll give you an example of this. During the Soviet era, one of the um, terrible things that were done by the communists is when they caught people doing what they considered to be crime against, crimes against the state, they would send them to Siberia. They also sometimes would send them to Siberia with their children and separate the children from the parents there. Mm -hmm. So the only way an eight-year-old could survive in Siberia would be how. How could they survive? They need food every day. They need a, a place to be. How could they survive? Mm -hmm. The only way they could survive is, if, is through theft, because they couldn't work hard enough to make, meet the quotas. So they wouldn't have enough food to eat from what they would bring. OK, clear? So the children became like animals. So the normal feelings that a person would have when they see a young child, like, let me help him, they didn't have that. When a, if a person were to wake up in the middle of the night and see a child near, their, near them, they would reach for their knife. You understand this? The children were predatory. So where's their freedom of choice? You understand the question? And the worst, uh, I mean, I don't know the worst, go measure worst, but one of the worst, one of the worst 
effects of this, of living in that kind of regime, was that people in a general sense, even people who were not sent to Siberia, did not have children who were predators, okay, um, developed a way of thinking in which everybody's a potential enemy. So the government is on the outside, but you don't know really who your neighbors are, and even in your family you're not always so sure. So one of my daughters was once teaching in um, a school for the children of Russian immigrants to Israel. So it was helping the children adjust to a new language, a new culture. They liked her. So they would come to the house, they made her little gifts, they liked her. Once the principal came to the door, he needed her attendance papers or something, so she got up and she left her stuff on the table. He said, oh, you got it. He said, Devora, you left your wallet on the table. So what do you think, you know, what do you think she said? Be her. It's fine. Like, it's fine. Like, the kids aren't going to take my stuff. What it, be the principal. What are you going to say? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Are you okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Do you think that they tried to take her stuff or not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. They're a culture to it. Okay, clear? That's the culture. So the reason why I'm telling you this is that their freedom of choice is limited, just like yours is. Everybody's is limited. But within the framework of their environment, there's still choices to make. So what that would mean is um, something closer, you know, to us. In the, in the central cities in America, in the core, are there kids who could reach the age of 10, 12, without ever seeing a good man? Are there kids like this in the inner city? Yes. Could be. Okay. A kid like this goes into um, the convenience store with his friends. They're there to steal. That's why they went in. They didn't go in there to see, like, what conveniences can I purchase today? <laughs> okay. So, um, so as they're leaving with their stuff, the guy behind the counter sees them, but he's afraid to do anything. Could that happen? Yes. That definitely could happen. And as they leave the store, each one of them, one after the other, spits at the guy behind the counter. Could that happen in real life? Yeah. It could. Let's say the hero of our story steals but doesn't spit. He made a choice there, okay? So that choice puts him in a level that, believe it or not, we'll call tzaddik, meaning it's the best choice that's open to him. Nobody could make all the choices, but anyone could be a tzaddik. Being a tzaddik means making the best choice that's open to you. So now let's take the same scenario. Someone goes into the convenience store and steals. But it's not this kid from the inner city, it's me. I go into the convenience store and I take, see something I want, and I take it. And um, I don't spit at the guy behind the counter as I leave. Is the word for me tzaddik? <laughs> no. No, okay. Um, the Chafetz Chaim, newly raised from the dead, goes into the convenience store, okay? The word for him, if he were to steal something, would be evil. Okay, clear? So only God could judge people. However, and this is a big however, we could judge deeds. So stealing isn't a good deed, but whether the person who stole is a tzaddik or not is something only God knows. Okay, this is clear? So the difference between what I just told you and relative morality, which is all the thing nowadays in the secular world, is we'll say stealing is bad, but that doesn't mean the thief is bad. We're not saying that because the thief is good that stealing, therefore, is a relative value. Okay, clear? Okay, so now that we understand free choice as being the highest level of our human capacity, so the question would be, what benefit does being able to make free choices give us? What's it good for? People will sometimes say, well, why is there evil in the world? And the answer is people can make choices. So say, well, why? If God like, made people who couldn't make choices, everybody would be nice, everybody would be good, there would no, be no really evil people. Wouldn't that be so much better? What's the problem there? We would be robots. And what's so bad about being a robot? You could still experience pleasure. You could still make human connection. But it wouldn't be human purpose. You don't value You don't value anything. But besides that, the greatest gift you can give anybody 
is the ability to be themselves. So what God gave humans is the ability for each person to determine who they are. There's no, there's no gift that's at all comparable to that. So that means that God's gift of free choice is the opposite of the choices made by the mother who's forcing the child to want to go to med school, saying, you choose, and in that regard, you're like me. But he put a stipulation, because a choice means always that there's choice A and there's choice B, and one is better and one is worse. Give me a definition of better and worse in this, in this paradigm. What makes a choice good or bad? Oh, again, we you put in the world to what? To dominate it in a way that's positive, that's like God. Any choice that shows our, our dominion of the world in a way that's limiting to the world, negative to the world, negative to ourselves, not godlike, is a bad choice. That makes sense to you? Mm -hmm. Now, for the ability for choices to be genuinely free, there has to be some appeal to making good, bad choices and some appeal to making good choices. So I'm not going to ask you to share this, but I want you to go back to this for a moment in your minds. Think about the worst life choice you ever made. The more you recognize that you could make terrible choices, the more you'll realize that at the moment you made that choice, you could have made another choice as well. Okay, could you see this? So that's where free choice lies. You could have done it differently. So the focus of free choice is when God said, you could have the whole world, not this fruit. What fruit was this? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now knowledge, in this sense, doesn't mean intellectual knowledge. Knowledge means integrating something and making it you. Don't make what's evil you. Don't integrate it. Don't eat it. Don't turn what's bad into your definition of self. So God created that to give us freedom. So what we're going to be talking about tomorrow is the parameters of freedom in gender relationships and the consequences of making bad choices, the consequences of making good choices, and how the foundations of reality in the world as we know it today stem from the choices that were made in the Garden of Eden. So that's what we're learning tomorrow. So show up. Okay. Now, before you, before you I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually ending more or less on time, which is not my habit, as you know. Okay, what? It's not a habit at all. No, it's not my habit. But what I want you to think for now, and I want you to talk about this before we end the class, what is all of this information, what does it say to you in your life right now today? So the basic core information is that you're a creation in a created world. Humans have capacity to express the divine image. We're meant to dominate. The genders are different. And that freedom of choice is a great gift, even though it could lead to terrible results. Mm -hmm.